Who really discovered Halley's Comet? Does Isaiah discuss the birth of the Messiah and claim him to be God himself? And why did the sea split for the Jews? This is Rabbi Yossi Madvig, and you're listening to Jews Did It First. I've got great news. I am now on YouTube. It's the same podcast, but some people find it easier to use YouTube, so there you go. I'm still working on getting up all of the past episodes, so bear with me. But please subscribe, share, get notifications, all that stuff. It really helps. And I'd love to hear from you, so send a review. Also, if you'd like to donate to help contribute to the podcast, please go to jewishoswego.org forward slash Jews did it first. Just click on the make a donation button in the upper right hand corner. And I want to give a special shout out to my international listeners. There's people in Israel, the UK, and whoever you are listening in Tokyo, you rock. I'd never thought I'd have a listener in Japan. That's amazing. So I'm not so sure how many more science theme shows I'm going to do. I might switch it up in a week or two, but this week's episode is great. Imagine you're a merchant in ancient Rome. You very often sail along the Mediterranean to do business in Syria, Egypt, and sometimes you even venture out to the Atlantic and go as far as England, or Britannia, as it was called then. You're quite adept at navigating with the stars, and you're on the way to Egypt to sell your goods and buy some things to sell back home. Suddenly, you realize something strange. You look from your charts and back to the sky to double-check your position. Wait. Something is missing. You can't find a star you've been using all week. It's vanished. Where did it go? And how do you get back on course? Now fast forward about 1600 years. It's 1705, and Edmund Haley, a British scientist, makes a prediction that will be proven correct and printed in history books for centuries to come. After seeing historical records of comet sightings in the year 1456, 1531, 1607, and 1682, Mr. Haley hypothesized that they were of the same comet, which he predicted would return in 1758. Unfortunately, Edmund Haley did not live to witness the comet's return. But when it was spotted by an amateur astronomer on December 25th, 1758, the comet became generally known as Haley's Comet. It wouldn't be visible to the naked eye, however, for another few months. As children, we all learned about comets, meteors, asteroids, Probably the most famous comet is Halley's Comet. That's because it's the only one we know of that can be seen on a relatively constant basis from Earth with the naked eye. So, when was it first seen? It's a bit unclear, but there seems to be ancient Babylonian, Greek, and Chinese records of a comet. The timing and surrounding circumstances seem to indicate that it was indeed Halley's Comet. Both Greek and Chinese sources mention a comet around the year 467 BCE. There was an appearance around 240 BCE, recorded by the Chinese, and the 164 and 87 BCE apparitions were recorded in Babylonian tablets. One of them, the 87 BCE, I believe, is actually in the uh, British Museum. The... I mean the Babylonian tablet, not the comet sighting. Now, Chinese astronomers of the Han Dynasty tracked the comet from August through October in around the year 12 BCE. And some people even suggest that that might be behind the Christian story of the Star of Bethlehem. There are many other records in history afterwards. However, they all have one thing in common. They don't seem to have any knowledge of the fact that it was all the same comet. 
that wouldn't happen until Mr. Haley in the 18th century. But what if I told you Jews did it first? What you don't know, and most likely neither did Edmund Haley, is that there is an obscure Talmudic discussion between two of the most prominent rabbinic sages in their day, Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua. In the Talmud, Tractate Harayis, page 10a, there's a story mentioned with Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua where they're traveling to Rome. During the trip, the two rabbis have this exchange. They once traveled on board a ship. Rabban Gamliel had with him only some bread, while Rabbi Yeshua had with him bread and flour. When Rabban Gamliel ran out of bread, he depended on Rabbi Yeshua's flour. Rabban Gamliel asked Rabbi Yeshua, Did you know that we would be so much delayed that you brought flour with you? Rabbi Yeshua answered him, A certain star rises once in seventy years and leads the sailors astray. And I suspected it might rise and lead us astray. Now, this trip happened in the year 95 CE, or thereabouts. The last appearance of Halley's Comet from that time was around 66 CE, and it wouldn't happen again until the year 141 CE. So this is, you know, pretty much smack in the middle of that. Clearly then, to me, it doesn't seem that that's what delayed their journey. And also, I think the trip is like three weeks long from Israel all the way to, to Rome by boat. So I'm not exactly sure why Rabban Gamliel didn't think he would run out of bread. But anyway, the point here is the comet, not the dietary issues going on in this story. Now, remember our Roman sailor at the beginning of the episode? He may have had no idea how he was let off course. But a few hundred miles away, in Israel... There are two rabbis who do. And even if it wasn't Haley's Comet, although I have a hard time believing that he's speaking about some other star that comes every 70 years or so, the novelty here is that here's a Talmudic reference, the only one of its kind, both in antiquity and in modern history, until Mr. Haley comes along around 1,600 years later, and isn't confirmed till a half a century after that, that this is a recurring comet, proving, once again, that when it comes to Halley's Comet and recognizing it as a recurring, recurring astronomical event, Jews did it first. And now, the counter-missionary. Now, there's a very interesting verse in the book of Isaiah. It's chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Uh, it's 6 and 7 in the Christian Bible. And missionaries used to claim that it foretells the birth of Messiah and that it claims that he's God himself and not just a man, as Jews claim to be, that he'll be a human being. So I'll read it to you in the King James Version so you can see how they might want to use this passage to prove the case from the Jewish Bible. It reads like this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Sounds pretty good, right? Not bad. Right? I can see why you might like this a lot. Well, there's a few problems here. One of them, it's just a flat-out mistranslation. Second, it's circular reasoning. And also we have an issue of context, context, context. What are we talking about in this chapter of Isaiah? Is this even a messianic prophecy? Let's deal with the 
circular reasoning first. This is the easiest one just to deal with, even if this is a messianic prophecy. Well, where is Jesus in all of this? You know, first you have to believe that he's the Messiah. And then you see this verse that says, oh, the Messiah should be called X, Y, and Z. Right? So then, since you believe that he's the Messiah, so you start calling him X, Y, and Z. Then you go back to the verse and you say, oh, see, he's the Messiah because we called him X, Y, and Z, just like the verse says. I mean, do you see how circular and ridiculous this whole train of thought is? So that's, it's just a very silly thing. So let's get rid of that right away. What about the mistranslation? Well, you'll notice that this verse renders it into the future, right? It's a prophecy about the future. Oh, he shall do this, and he will be born, and uh, he will be called, etc., etc. There's a big problem with that. Verse 5, or 6 in the Christian Bible, is completely past tense. It says the words, Eulad, a child was born to us. Nitan, a child was given to us. Vatehi, and the government was on his shoulders. Vaikra, and he was called. So, here, all of these are in the past tense. In the King James Version, however, it's all in the future tense. Why is that? Now, the best way to prove this, aside from just knowing biblical Hebrew, is to see other places where the King James Version translates these words in the past tense. Lucky for you, there's tons of examples, especially for the word yulad. He was born. And you can find this all over Genesis because people are being born all the time over there. Um, and throughout the Bible, uh, Genesis 4, 26, 10, 21, 35, 26, just for a couple examples, where the King James Version itself even translated in the past tense, was born or were born. It's not shall be or is born. Vatahi, it was. We find this in Isaiah itself, 525, 23, 3, 29.11. Uh, in none of these is the word rendered in the future tense, because that's just impossible. Finally, the word vaikra, we see all over the place, very popular word also, uh, and he was called. Uh, you can find this in Leviticus 1.1, Isaiah 21.8. 36, 13, elsewhere else as well. Again, rendered in the past tense. Only here are these three words magically transformed into the future. And that is to allow for the passage to be used to missionize and quote unquote prove from the Jewish Bible that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, what is this even talking about? Well, I'll tell you, it's not even messianic at all, as you can clearly see. I mean, if it's talking in the past tense, we're obviously not talking about a future messianic prophecy here. What it is talking about is actually a king. It is talking about a Davidic king, but not the Messiah. It's talking about Hezekiah, or Hezekiah, and it's talking about a miraculous victory over the Assyrian army in the 7th century BCE that happens. I can actually prove this to you. If you take a look at the very beginning, like we said, go to the, you can't just parachute down into the middle of a chapter and say, oh, this is what the verse says, especially if you're mistranslating everything. So it begins like this. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath a light shine. So they were in a really bad situation, and it's going to be great. Right? What does it mean? There's darkness, land of the shadow of death. This is really bad stuff. It's terrible. And guess what? A light shined. You've multiplied the nation. You've increased the joy. The joy all this good stuff is going to happen. It continues on. Uh, now, verse 3 here, very important. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken it as in the days of Midian. Hmm. Days of Midian, huh? What is that referring to? Well, very simple. The days of Midian is a time going back to the book of Judges when Gideon or Gideon was uh, becoming the judge over there just before he did, right? So God tells him, look, here's the problem. Because the Jews were being oppressed by the nation of Midian. It was just too much for them. God tells him, look, here's the deal. This big, strong army, something like 100,000 troops or something like this, you're going to defeat them. Okay, so Gideon raises, gets an army together. And he's got, I think, 10,000 guys. Now, it's still, they're outnumbered well over 10 to 1. I think it was like 120,000 troops, actually. So he gets 10,000. And God says, oh, no, 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 that's not good enough. You need to have less. Because you're going to say, oh, since we had 10,000, yeah, it was still miraculous. But, you know, we're, we're 10,000 guys strong, so it worked out. No, less. And he whittles down the army. And eventually, he ends up with 300 guys. So they go to the Midianite camp. They surround it or whatever. And they drop these pots to make this big noise. And there's fire and totally catch the Midianites off guard and go in and slaughter them. Over 100,000 troops, okay, with just 300 people. Tremendous, miraculous victory. So remember, it said at the end of verse 7, the, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
form this, right? That was that was how it ended up. Now, this is a very strange verse, a very strange phrase. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this actually only occurs three times in the entire Jewish Bible. One of them in our verse here in Isaiah. Where else does it appear? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 31, when the defeat of the Assyrian army comes about through Hezekiah, through Hezekiah, it's about to happen there. It says again, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Then it happens a third time. What is the third time? Again in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 37, it is actually discussing this very event again. And what does he say over there? The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. This is a very special event in Jewish history when basically the Assyrian army had decimated the ten northern tribes of Israel, sent them scattered, they're still lost today, and had almost completely captured the entire area of Judah, of Judea with the exception of Jerusalem, basically. Even the surrounding areas right around Jerusalem, they couldn't get in. And this miraculous victory happened where God himself sent the angel of death and just completely decimated Sanherib's tribe, uh, his army. Completely gone. And that was this miraculous victory hearkening back to the days of Gideon in the book of Judges, when 300 men completely decimated the Midian army. And that's why that mention of Midian is brought here in chapter 9. It's connecting these two events. And we see this is through Hezekiah. And who is this child? This child is when Hezekiah was born. Hezekiah was born. Now the final point over here claiming that he's God himself, as we saw from the verse where it says he's going to be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, all this stuff. This is a little bit misleading. First of all, a very interesting fact. When it comes to the Hebrew, the way that Hebrew grammar is structured, you could very easily render this verse in a very different way. You could simply render it, not that his name was called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and all this kind of stuff. You could say that God is naming him. Vayikra Shemo, Pelo Yoetz, Keo Gibor, Avi Ad, the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, called his name Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And so his Kiyahu, Hezekiah is only called Prince of Peace. That is a perfectly valid way of rendering this verse, given Hebrew grammar. There's absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. But let's just say for the moment that, uh, it, let's say all those things that he is called. Now, is calling him God? Is that saying that he is God? His, his name being God? Remember, it doesn't say, and he will be God. It's he will be called, his name will be called Mighty God or whatever like this. Big deal. Do you know what the word Hezekiah means? Chizkiyahu? Chazak means strong or powerful. And the Yah or Yahu at the end means God. God, Powerful God. It works. There's no problem there. That's just his name. In Genesis, uh, the forefather, Jacob sets up a an altar and he calls it God. Moses sets up an altar. Calls it, Kael Nisi, God is my savior. He calls, all, all these altars are set up elsewhere by Moses, by other people. And they have the name God in them. Does that mean they're God? Of course not. There are many people in the Bible with God as an Eliyahu. Or actually, there's a guy just named Eli. It means my God. His name is my God. So if I call him my God, does that mean that he's my, he's God? No, that's just his name. And in fact, our prophet who's speaking here, Isaiah, Yeshiahu, means God saves. Speaking of God saving, this week's Torah portion deals with the splitting of the sea, which saves the Jews from the approaching Egyptian army. But how did it split? So we're used to the idea of Moses raises his staff and the sea splits, and, and that happened. But the Medrash relates an interesting caveat of the story. There was a man named Nachshon ben Aminadav. He started wading into the sea before it even split. The Jews are arguing over what to do. Should we pray to God? Should we return to Egypt? Should we fight with them? What, what should go on? Nachshon realizes, look, we're supposed to go forward. We have to receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. God took us out of Egypt. We just got to keep going. So he goes in, and as the water begins to reach his nose, and he's going to soon be unable to breathe, boom, that's the moment that the waters split, and the Jews proceed on dry land. But what's the point of here? Why didn't he just wait? Say, we need to see. So he should complain to Moses, say, look, forget the praying, forget the fighting, forget returning. Let's just go forward. Why does he jump in? I think there's a few lessons to be learned by this. One of them is we don't need to wait around for our leaders 
to tell us to do the right thing. When we know it's right, and we know that we have to follow God, just do it. Just go in. Aye, it looks impossible. You're wading into the sea. There's no way to do this. In fact, not only does it seem like there's no way to do it, you're just going to go into the water. What are you going to do? Not only that, but you keep going. Even when it seems like it's coming up to your nose, you're not going to be able to breathe. You're not going to be able to do what's right. And it seems like maybe this isn't even the right decision. Maybe I shouldn't have done what's right because look what's happening because of what I did what's right. I'm, I'm, I, I did what's right and I lost my job or I had to spend a ton of money to make it happen or people are so upset at me I lost my quote unquote friends for doing what was right. It seems like not only was it so difficult to do the right thing, but it seems I'm losing, I could lose everything because I'm doing the right thing. Nevertheless, we learn from Nachshon ben Aminadov, just go. Just do the right thing. You don't have to wait for Moses to split it for you. You don't have to wait for someone else to come along and be some torchbearer and then you can follow them. Be the leader. Go ahead and do what's right. Follow God. Follow his commandments. Go forward and you will see just when you think that it's going to never happen and not work. Boom. That's the moment that the sea will split. And not only you, but everyone else who seemed to have been left behind, who seemed to have turned on you and wanted to do the wrong thing, they will also now be able to follow on dry land to do the right thing. Please feel free to continue the conversation on Facebook at Jews Did It First, or you can email me at rabbi at jewishoswego.org. Or if you happen to have my phone number, you're welcome to give me a text or a call. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And please, again, check us out on YouTube. You can go to Apple iTunes, the podcast. Uh, you can find us on uh, find me on, on Google Play as well as Stitcher. I'm everywhere you want to be. So please continue the conversation. Have a wonderful and peaceful weekend. Until next week, Shabbat Shalom. I promise to be loyal and faithful I'll represent you, I won't disgrace you